gracious Father, Creator, Savior, kind and loving Father, we come before you this evening as we um, wish to study your word. And we just pray for those who uh, are normally here that they're just, they're, they're going to be a little late, but they'll be with us. Lord, as we continue to study your word, open our hearts and our minds. Let us be fully convinced of your power, your strength, and your love for us, and the fact that uh, you are there for us no matter what, Lord, that, that you are there as we come to you. Um, we may fall away, but you'll always be there waiting for us to return. I just want to praise you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. John sixteen sixteen, A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father? And they said, Therefore, what is this that he saith, A little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of what I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while ye shall see me? Verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And you now know, therefore, have, have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man takes from you. Verse 23. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. 26. In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly without figures of speech. 30. Now that we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee, by this we believe that thou camest from God. Jesus answered them and said, do ye now believe? Behold, the hour comes, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world." I really like, uh, I have the NIV, I really like verse 31. You believe at last, <laughs> Jesus answered. Uh, it's like, well, he's just, he's, he's so close to the cross and finally, <laughs> they're finally getting it. Um, Sadly, I think he's saying that they still don't really quite get it. <laughs> just like us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But at least the minute, they believe. <laughs> the minute the cross happened, they forgot everything he had said until after the resurrection. Uh, I, I, I believe I know what they're saying here, but how often do we know? Well, actually, how often will Jim know what I'm thinking in Sabbath school? He takes a look at my face and he knows immediately that I've got a question or I've got a statement. And so... I think Jesus here is, is looking at them and just says, you know, and they too, they're looking at him and saying, wow, 
maybe maybe now we get it. Or he's saying maybe now they get. It. I'm not sure, but you know there are times, like I said, Jim will just let me know that I've got a question. I think in um, I don't know if I'm going ahead, but 24 he says until now you have asked nothing in my name. But the verse before it says, you, whatever you ask the Father in my name. But I think right there he was asking you, if you have any questions now, t talk to me. You know? And still, I mean. Well, g given what he just spoke about, <clears throat> that they're going to go through a lot of um, confusion, conflict, and emotional things. Mm. I would think that those are the things that they may have needed and one needs to ask God about their relationship to him and what they're going through as far as um, whatever set of circumstances in their faith. Those are the things that he wants to, um, not at all, but those are things that I think are the most important about um, he cares for us in terms of our relationship with him and um and the trials we go through within ourselves with him. So do you think they were stunned? Well, that they that they didn't ask him any questions, you know, right there. Well, you tell me um in verse uh 21, a woman when she is in travail um <laughs> Do you ask a woman questions or ask anything like that when you're in that kind of uh, ready to uh, <laughs> deliver a child? I don't think you do. <laughs> Not if you want to live. No, you don't. You don't ask any woman that. Any? No, no, no. I went through it eight times. <laughs> wow, amen. And I think that's true. It's, uh, you know, as... As soon as um, the the woman, uh, the loved one, delivers the child, they don't remember any of those contractions anymore. You know, right. and I think Jesus is saying that as well. Um, he, he's saying, you know, that um, the anguish and the difficulties and the conflict and all of that, that's going to, you know, turn uh, for good, for joy. You know, I think my husband thought I was nuts because when I started going into labor, I'm like, I ain't never doing this again. And Ivan had no more than been born, and I was saying I wanted to have another one. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as that birth process happens, you know, the woman gets a, a, a massive rush of oxytocin mm. to, to, to bond with the child and, and to have those you know, feelings of, of, of love and joy. It's it's the love that erases the memory of the sorrow. If he didn't, there wouldn't be any children in the world. <laughs> that's right. And then that's really the whole message of the cross that, you know, it's it's the love that makes the sacrifice worth it. Mm. Yeah. So I, I just have a question. You know, I know the little while and 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 stuff and now he made himself known to them um for those 40 days but after that he really didn't make himself known in that way right his physical appearance after the 40 days yeah yeah no he ascended then right so he did appear to, to Paul on the road to Saul. That was sort of oh, different. Well, yeah, but not not in his, hum I mean, spiritually or humanity. I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly what happened with, with Saul, but it's very interesting when you look at what happened with Saul. It, it was, you know, the right. Bible talks about it being a vision, but at the same time, other people saw the light and other people, you know, fell down as dead. And there was more than just something happening in, in Paul's mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was, and he, he talks about how the Lord appeared to him. <laughs> so, um, 
but it wasn't the same as, I mean, maybe it was in his glorified form. I don't know. I guess, I mean, it would have been in his glorified form, but in general, no, he didn't appear to them after that. It was 40 days. So is 22 answer your question partly, Sue? Is that? Yeah. And it's the, just the question about 23 and 24. In that day, you will ask me nothing because he won't be there, right? But I'm most, most assured I say to you that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will be there. And then, of course, he said, so I'm, I'm saying 23 is during the time, those three days, or in that day, of course, they can't ask him nothing. He's not around. Uh, and that he's directing them to the Father in his name, I think. And then until now, you have asked me nothing in my name, in his name. I don't know. Yes, I, I see the instruction to, to send our petitions to the Father in his name. Everything the Son has is the Father's. So really, he's pointing us to the source. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's the revelation of the name of God in Christ that you know opens that treasure house to us. It's not faith in the good works that I do, it's the faith in his name. Yeah. I mean, just what he's gonna do for us in six is, you know, and that they you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Father himself loveth you. Well, doesn't he pray to the Father for the Comforter to come? Yeah, and he says that I will, he also says that I will, he told them that he would pray for them, that I pray that I will keep them that you have given me. Oh, come on. Dogs. Interesting, he's really, you know, he's talking about his him going to the cross and the consequences of that for us. And when he says in, in 26, at that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you, I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. You know, in, in mm. verse 25 as well, these things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall <laughs> no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Uh, he's really saying, you, you, at the cross, you're going to see the Father. You'll, you'll realize how much the Father loves you. Mm. When you see how he gave me up to the cross for you. Yeah, this whole thing, he's lifting up the Father. Yes. You don't think it more refers back to John 14, 16? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever? Well, that will, that's the means by which it will he'll affect those gifts and that conviction and that understanding. So it's, it's all connected, but I see him really saying here that once we realize that the father was willing you know, to give up his son to the cross, we'll realize his love for us is, is beyond anything that we can comprehend. And then we'll realize that when we pray, God, God isn't like purposely withholding what's good. We'll realize he's giving us everything. <laughs> he's willing to give us everything because he was willing to give us everything in, in his son. Mm. I think the light bulb that's going on here, though, is that they're actually finally, truly believing that he came from the Father. Mm. You know, mm. the, the evidence that they have experienced up until this point is sort of all coming together for them. And it, it's like, ah. Now we they they really really understood, um, 
and and it's it's so interesting that it's so close to the actual crucifixion that it takes them that long you know they they believed in the miracles they believed in um that evidence that they were seeing but this was deeper this was the the yeah. true conviction in their hearts and really really understanding oh you know you and the father are one you 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 came from the father this is a gift that the father gave us do you yeah. think here then they're giving up the idea of the temporal king and no not yet <laughs> <laughs> I think they're believing that, you know, truly this is the son of God. I get it. I, I, I get it. I mean, it, what, what's happening, what we're seeing, this is a God thing. Yes. This is the God thing. We can't change it. This totally is a God thing. Yeah. And you see, as you're saying, sister, so the, uh, in 28 and 29, that assurance that he came from the father seems to be what they really were wanting. They wanted him to plainly say, I came from the Father, and I'm going back to the Father. And now you're speaking plainly <laughs> yeah. what we want to hear. Yeah. yeah, from 25 on, he says, I'm giving up the, the Proverbs or giving up speaking to you in prophecy. But here we go. Here's plainly. Here's what I got to tell you. Yes. Because he had really, you know... He had not gone around saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, worship me. <laughs> and uh, because he knew the consequences of doing that. And But now the time has come, and so he is speaking plainly right before the cross. And actually, him speaking plainly is what's going to bring him to the cross, actually, kind of ironically. But it's what they've been longing to hear him say. And well, and what, what was the because reason, right? For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. They, they, they have surrendered to that love for him. They, they, you know, where else, where else can we go? You know, nobody speaks like you, you know? Well, it's, it's one thing as he's spoken... <clears throat> 15 about the persecution and hate that will come from without externally and now he's talking in 16 the real deeper matter and that is not to be connected with christ physically mm. uh, and uh, he he really is addressing uh the the depth of his relationship to them and turning them and letting know the holy spirit and the father but um it reminds me of uh, <coughs> In, I think it's in Deuteronomy, where um, the Lord says to them, well, go up, uh, you know, go up to, um, you know, after they had done all their things, it says, yeah, go up to the promised land. You can go there and everything, but I'm not going to go with you. And Moses said, no, Lord, we're not going anywhere without <laughs> you. You know, um, heaven is not worth going to, if you will. The promised land is not worth going to unless you're there. Mm -hmm. um and um he's he's letting them know and and uh, addressing their deeper sorrow um that he's not going to be with them no more and you know he's very tender in his um uh sharing that with him yeah and you know what and we ourselves look forward to that time to be with him physically mm. you know whereas um <coughs> Like you said, they're, they're, they're going to miss him physically because they've had him physically. And now they're on the spiritual aspect of having that relationship with him. And we as well. We can't wait for that time where we're with him um, physically that, you know, our think, eyes may see him. But think about it. If, <clears throat> if you could be in heaven, but Christ is not there, huh. is it worth it? Is it worth being in heaven with no tears, no crying? <coughs> um, all conflict is gone. Would, is, no. is that a place you want to be? No. Nope. Wouldn't be heaven. Wouldn't no. be heaven. No. Yeah. And, and, and in some ways, I think he's saying to them um, that that heaven is going to abide with them now because the Father will be with them through the Comforter. 
that, that that experience, that relationship will be with them. Yeah, but after he says that question, uh, Sue, in verse 31, that um, you were uh, excited about, then <laughs> there's another side to that question. Do you now believe? And then he goes on to say, the hour is coming, and what's going to happen? You're going to be scattered. You're going to go to your own. You're going to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So, um, uh, you know, I just wonder, um, you know, how much they did believe. And our they, question they think, they think they now believe, but right. <laughs> they actually don't really yet believe. Right. <laughs> or don't understand what it really means to, be, to exercise faith in his name. Yeah. And I think that question is a, a question for me and everyone today. Do you now believe? Mm -hmm. yes. In the in the midst of um, anguish and trial and tribulation, do you scatter? Right. And we don't know how we're going to react when, you know, things really get heated and persecution becomes um, unbearable for us. As we were talking the last time we got together about the fact it's not going to come from our enemies, it's going to come from our friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and Jesus, it, it, he went, he experienced that and they got to see that. And they, they who know, knew him so closely scattered. Um, we, we may do just the same. We, we think you know, we think that we will be able to withstand it, but can we? I don't know. Well, in, in part, um, you know, he as we've read here in John, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in some ways, we could know by the decisions we're making moment by moment daily, whether we're scatter, scattering or gathering with him. Yes. It also makes me think of, you know, when Peter, you know, claimed, you know, these may deny you, but I'll never deny you. When he told them, you're denying me thrice this night. And, uh, you know, Sister White writing about that said that, that Peter was, was totally sincere and meant every word of it, but he just didn't know himself. And uh, we, we may often be the same where we think we believe and we're totally sincere in that thought. <laughs> Just like they were here when they said, now we believe, but we don't know ourselves and what we will do <laughs> and what we're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. but, but he does. But he does. That's right. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that he's saying this and know that that's going to happen, mm. he hasn't given up on them. Yeah. I, I marvel at verse 24. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. You know, that doesn't that doesn't mean that you did, they just didn't say in Jesus' name at the end of their prayer. Like he's saying, up until this point, all your prayers have been selfish or had selfishness mingled with them. <laughs> You've asked nothing in my name, but once they once they experience the cross, then they understand how to pray in His name for. To, for victory over self, or being willing to sacrifice everything for others, hmm. their, their their prayer will change once they experience that in a way that hasn't happened yet at this point. And, and, and it's unrealistic that it should have happened up to this point. Yeah, it wasn't because possible. Because we 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 think, oh, he's he's walking with them, he's doing X, Y, and Z, and why aren't they believing? Because the cross hasn't happened yet. Yes. Well, and it was their culture, too. What they were expecting was what their culture had taught them to expect. Which is and isn't that the it same for us. Too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? I think it, you know, the, the notion that he spoke to them in Proverbs was a good thing. Hmm. Because when he to spoke to them plainly, they certainly didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and you know a song a proverb a, a poem sometimes we can um recall that in our memory and understand its meaning much more yeah yeah and i think the recall they had throughout the whole books there you know like because I, I get it here like when when somebody says something that it just like all of a sudden it just clicks like oh now i understand that in deuteronomy or you know it like the lord just brings the light yeah that connects here to here and uh and you see them how 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 they're connecting things as they're writing and walking <laughs> Yes, and I think the most important part of what you said, Sue, is that the Lord brings you, you know, he He brings you back to Deuteronomy. He brings you back to the things yes. that you read before and gives you a deeper understanding of what you're looking at now. Yes, yes, absolutely. We also see in, in Matthew 13, he tells them how he, he teaches in parables, but really the or proverbs, but really he, he says that's for the others. And that when, when we, like the disciples, go to him and ask him privately, what do these things mean? He, he tells us and explains it to us. That's his purpose. He, his purpose isn't just to be mysterious in parables and um, but you have to go and inquire and say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And really have a heart open to hear and understand what it means. Mm -hmm. I, uh, <clears throat> I may, uh, um, I have I did this thought about verse 28. I came forth from the father. He didn't come forth from Mary. Um, Mary did not conceive him. It was the Holy Spirit that conceived him in her womb. He came forth from the Father. Yes. Mm. Amen. Mm. But we know that they always carry the lineage back. Right. So, you know. But remember, <coughs> but remember, um, this was from the tribe of um, <clears throat> Judah, and no priest was from Judah. With the priest uh, that he came from, symbolically, was from Melchizedek. Amen. And this is this is coming forth from Judah. Hmm. No priest came from the tribe of Judah. It was the Levi and Aaron? Mm -hmm. Right, but don't the lineage is typically carried back through the father, no matter you know earthly right. father right or... yes both joseph and mary were from the tribe of judah they were um yeah i mean just which is the oh, go ahead well it's just the fulfillment of um the seed would come from king david right yes so speaking of King David, I'm sure if Pastor Tim was here, he would comment on verse 23 and verse 26. And in that day and at that day. Right. Of course, he day would of ask, well, day. <laughs> day of atonement. Day of atonement. Yes. Day of atonement. Day of atonement. And also, it's really, I mean, he's in the context of what he's directly saying to the disciples. He's talking about the cross, which we know is the first coronation. So we could say at the day of the coronation of the king. And of course, in, in our day, that's the second coronation. That we are to have this transformative experience where before we were praying, you know, not in his name, really, and asking, all right. And then he'll, he'll reveal his love to us the same way. Um, through our personal cross experience. And then we'll, we'll have that transformation in our prayer life, in our experience. You know, you guys were talking about when I had left was about the genealogy or, or knowing where they're come. But, you know, my, my devotion today was um, 
in Titus, but avoid foolish, foolish disputes and genealogies and contentions and striving. Because the whole purpose is that you belong to the Lord, right? You belong to Christ at that time. But that, that, that had importance and value for them at that time. You know, what tribe you were in, what sect you were in, all of that. And that doesn't happen in Adventism today. <laughs> no, but I, I, I love when you go through the line and you have Rahab there, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, here you go. That's right. <laughs> as, as, as was noted in uh, that gathering in New York, um, Abram was um, righteous when he was uncircumcised, not when he was circumcised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was a good study on that. <laughs> you know, I, I think the woman giving birth is a great example of, of the pain that they were going to be in. The pain that they were going to be in, that, that reality, that everything. You know, un until that time where, where pretty much the, the birth was going to happen to them, that they, they realized that Christ was birthed in them. Mm. <sighs> you know, I just... And that 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 was going to be their joy because he talked about joy again here. Um, where was it? That's that's the real birth of 22. the king is in you. Yes, and therefore you the, you now have sorrow, but you will see again that your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will be able to take from you. You know our experience with Christ, no one can take that. Not <laughs> not one. Amen. And it's 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 almost indescribable. You know, I've had people ask me, you know, when I pray and I get an answer, how do you know that came from the Lord? And I said, well, first of all, it's not my thought pattern. It's not where my head would have been going. And also, um, it's it's outside of me. It's it's. Um, it's a different type of an answer. And so I think that um, trying to explain the joy that we feel as Christians that's actually bubbling up within us is another hard thing to explain to somebody that has not experienced it. And I mm. think um, explaining it with the birth of a child is a really nice way of um at least putting it in terms that they could grasp without having gone through it themselves. Which is actually why God made birth the way it is <laughs> mm. for that very purpose mm -hmm. to teach that lesson to those who don't know him. It's really interesting prophetically if you think, you know, we're talking about the Day of Atonement here at that day. In the coronation of the king, you know, in verse 21, it, when it talks about this woman, we could think about prophetically the woman who yeah. gives birth in mm -hmm. Revelation 12 to a man child. Mm -hmm. And here we have in, in our day, that's, you know, the church giving birth to, to the fit man who leads the scapegoat into the wilderness. The day, the day of Atonement can't come to a conclusion until there's a fit man who's able to take the scapegoat into the wilderness, Azazel. That's, that's the 144,000 in my eyes. That, that final witness is what is like the, the final nail in Satan's coffin that he's led away. That his deceptions lose their power. And, and God's character is vindicated. Uh, but we have the, you're going you're gonna to go through this birth process. And as we go through this birth process, we're going to weep and lament, and the world is going to rejoice. But our sorrow will be turned to joy. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Now, is it that um, um, is it that he ascended and came back, or did he stay here for forty days? When they see him again. Well, you know, when when he um, Mary said he said to Mary, "Don't touch me, Mary." Did he ascend at that point in time and then return? Um, that same day, yeah. Because um, it's my understanding in reading the um, the dedication of the sanctuary that the high priest, when the sanctuary was dedicated, he went into the most holy of holies mm -hmm. to for the whole consecration, and he came out. And and it says in Daniel that he was, you know, showed in, uh, that he was escorted into the fire of the Ancient of Days. And he did go into the Most Holy of Holies. He didn't stay there, but that area was dedicated because of his sacrifice. And um, then he served in the Holies until um, 1844. Then he went into the Most Holies, is my understanding. Mm-hmm. In, in Exodus 40, Moses goes into the most holy place when the sanctuary is set up at the beginning. Right. Same right. thing, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that happened that, uh, that when he resurrected and went to the Father to have the assurance that the sacrifice was accepted. Right. Yeah. And that's where, um, that's where uh, Ford really messed up. Mm. that aspect he didn't talk about that yeah. piece of going into the most holy because he he thought you know he stayed in the most holy but that was mm. only to anoint as you say uh, moses and it's consecrating of that um of the tabernacle and that specific all the areas but that specific place had to be uh, anointed mm. yes that's right so are you seeing that in a little while, in a little while? Who are you asking, Sue? You, wh whoever. I, I guess think, you I think the little while and the little while is, you know, just his, his death on the cross till his, you know, when he appears to them after the resurrection. Yeah. I think that's, it's, it's as simple as that. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's talking about that the time he when he after he leaves Mary and goes to the the father and comes back. So he actually doesn't appear to the disciples until after that anyway. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing there. Yeah. Right. A little while and you will not see me. And again, in a little while you will see me. Mm -hmm. But they did not see him until he came back. That's right, yes. Okay. So let me make sure. You know, going back to um, 32 and um, how the, he knows they're going to be scattered. They're basically going to reject and abandon him. But um, he, he has great hope because he knows of his relationship with the father um that um that doesn't change and as a result of that his relationship with the father and giving over his will he knows in verse 33 that we have peace in him we will have peace despite all the rejecting the abandoning the scattering um and what have you we will we will find that peace in him. Psalm 91. Mm. You know? And he, and he doesn't say, oh, it's just going to be super easy and no problems. <laughs> no. So this is going to be trials and weeping and sorrow. and <laughs> But it's temporary. It certainly doesn't feel temporary when you're going through it, though. That's right. And it feel temporary for him either. That's that's what Hebrews twelve. No chastening seems pleasant as you endure it. Joy comes in the morning. But in Romans, there, in chapter two, you know, he talks about those 
were contentious and not obeying the truth um, and obeying unrighteousness, that they'll have tribulation and anguish upon the soul of every man that doth evil. But then he goes and says, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that work good. Work good. That <laughs> despite the um, situation, there will be, um, we will have peace. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting in what you read, right? The 2.10 and, you know, how he says, um, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. <laughs> it right. kind of looks like, didn't he just do partiality there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good so did, did he have to do partiality, as you call it, because the Jews did not do their part? Um, well, I think at that time it was to the Jews first until they... Um, but what was, them. but what was, the, what were they supposed to do? Right. And because they didn't, then his his word has to go more direct, if you will, to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But he he he's very clear in Romans that all have sinned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's no respecter of persons at all. Whether you're a Jew and have the oracles or whether you're a pagan and live in, you know, nature, it doesn't matter to him. Right. So he says, I've overcome the world. So he is standing um, and has dominion. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and he the... wants us to also have that dominion and standing on the sea of glass, doesn't he? Yes. The son of David reigns. Now he really prepared him, right? Because in the beginning of this, he, he showed him about them in relation to the world. Then he, then he gave the answer for them in relationship to the world, which was his Holy Spirit. And then he, he, he gives them the hope of his return right after that, you know, in, in chapter 16. And at the very end, when he talks about in the world, you shall have tribulation, but I be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The root word for overcome there is Nikeo, which is where you get Nicodemus, who means overcomer among the people. Mm. And and how did you know what what did Jesus teach Nicodemus? You, you have to be born again through the Spirit, mm -hmm. bringing it back to that Spirit. If we're going to overcome as He overcame, it's it's through the Spirit that you overcome. Through that death and resurrection, born again experience, mm. which they don't they don't understand, but he's saying you will understand soon <laughs> when you really see what it looks like. Yeah, you can even remove the word "will," and in the world you have tribulation. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the King James, it's shall, you know, that more imperative that it absolutely will be so. Yes. You know, and you, you just, you do count those all joy, trial, tribulation, all those things because, you know, they, they lead you to him, you know. Count it all joy, he says. When you, when you come down to it and you think about this, <clears throat> a little while mm -hmm. um you know nothing seems like a little while when you're in um labor mm -hmm. right sue mm -hmm. that, that doesn't seem like a little while um and yet it is a little while and um you know the the, the set of circumstances that we face um 
um, makes time seem to just be so protracted. Um, but um, keeping the perspective, I guess, that in a little while, um, that that this too shall pass, you know, um, that um, it's 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 temporary, and and as he says in James, uh, you know, to um, you know accept these type of trials and to seek wisdom from above, and God will give you that wisdom mm -hmm. to get through that trial. Um, and so the notion of a little while, um, we begin to. Uh, experience time in a very, very different way um, than we usually will experience time. Um, it almost seems to stand still, but here he's saying it, it's a while. Okay, it, it there is an end point in this. There is an end point. So I think it's an encouraging thought. A little while to uh, maintain a perspective that there is an end point. There is a hope um, that it, it will uh, come to an end. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I say that in, in Genesis 1-1, one, 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 when God creates time, the whole purpose of creating time was to put a time limit on sin and suffering. Mm. There was no need for a time before that. But when God was now going to allow this these principles that are against what he stands for to, to temporarily exist. He, he, he kind of gives that promise by saying, you know, in the beginning, that's where time began, <laughs> that I'm going to put a time limit on this, this suffering a little while, mm. but it will be worth it. Just like with the birth. I mean, even the, you know, as, as long as labor may seem, and you know, some women are in labor for more than 24 hours. Um, but compared to the lifespan of the child that's born, you know, how much time is that really? And how, you know, the suffering of this, this world, even for 6,000 years, what is that to eternity that follows? Yeah. And, and I'm, 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 I'm of the opinion that um, come the seventh day, he finished his work. And he rested. He he didn't finish his work because he created rest, rest and time. And he doesn't say, and that was the morning and that was the evening. They entered into an eternity at that point in time, um, forever and ever. Um, and I I'm of the opinion that it was in the on the Sabbath and in the eternity that Adam and Eve turned their backs on God. Mm. Jesus, Jesus did say, you know, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Yeah, he, he, he didn't finish his work on the seventh day because he had to create rest. Manuha. He, he created Manuha uh, is what he created. Space and time for rest. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we occupy so much space, but not time. Hmm. And, they're, and they're, you know, integrated and interwoven together. You can't separate space and time in reality. No, you can't, and neither can <laughs> science understand both. That's right. <laughs> yes. Hey, you know, he really pre is preparing him in John. I, you know, I was looking at that last verse, that in me you may have peace. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm, I said, you know, in me, in me, they're with him, they're with him, they're with him. And now he's telling you, okay, I'm just going to, you know, come up again of what it means to abide in me. Because what she said in 15. 15, 4. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's seven abides there, you know. And, 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 you know, did they understand what it meant to abide in him? Because he's there with him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's something I've really, and Greg and I both have kind of wrestled with. Because 
if you think about that, abiding in him and him abiding in you and you know, your mind has to focus on other things in this world. You have work that you have to do. You have children to attend to. You have meals to prep. And um, yet, I think what it's really talking about is such a deep-seated belief and conviction that um, it really precipitates all of your choices and it, it really precipitates who you are as a person that that change really is constantly happening from the inside out because mm -hmm. you have that connection mm -hmm. if you have that connection you're you're always reading his word and understanding more and more you're always um changing because the holy spirit is continually convicting you of your sin and um, that's that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. and that, that's hard to hear. Uh, we don't like to hear things that aren't pleasing. Uh, we like to have our ego stroked, and that's not the way this works. No. Um, so I think that, to me, that's what abiding is: is really living out that He who who um, started this work in me is faithful to complete it unto mm -hmm. the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. Room. But <clears throat> at the same time, Sue, nobody, nobody can abide in him when he was on the cross. Only mm -hmm. he could endure that. There was no other that could endure that. None. Yeah, abide in what he's done. And what he's done, yeah. But we because, can't you know. Abide. Right, because when he told the apostle, are you are you willing, are you able to go what I've gone through? Yeah. And he said, surely, what do you say? Surely you will go through what I'm going through. I think that's how it says I got to go, go through that. But the only way that they can handle going through what he went through is because he went through it. Right. You know? <laughs> And, and you know we need to take to heart that he he didn't just get victory over sin in general at the cross he he experienced our each one of our sins personally and he also experienced what it would take to get victory over that sin and that's why we have peace in him because he's that's where the victory is there's no, there's no peace without righteousness you know he, he's He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who's first king of righteousness, then king of peace. Without righteousness, there is no peace. And we can't have righteousness of our own selves. It's only in Christ that we have righteousness. So it's only in Christ that we have peace. Yeah. It's only in him that we have anything, and everything that we have yeah. is, is um, everything good. Yes. <laughs> that, that's the lovely thing about his righteousness. It's very, very, very pure. Yes. You know, when um, Sue was talking about <clears throat> the Holy Spirit talking and what have you, and I'll have those, um, I call it um, silence. Um, the, in that silence, I'll, I'll hear him talk about his righteousness and and I can, I can in some ways, I always associate it with it's so pure, his righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's lovely. You desire his purity in that righteousness. It's that free flowing purity that I talked about when I was visiting there in my mm -hmm. sermon. The the liberty is the yeah. free the free flowing purity from Christ. Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely pure, isn't? no contamination there's no impurity nothing nothing no it's uh it's uh and and it's inviting um it's it's uh it's it's um for someone who's unrighteous like myself it it it's it's very inviting it's it's um it doesn't you don't want to avoid it you don't push it away you want to go towards it 
and come into it. Mm. You want to abide in it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Amen. There there has to be uh, something uh, triggered in you in order for the Holy Spirit to be working because we know how many millions of people that uh, Christ, the cross, means nothing. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I felt that way for a lot of years. And, you know, all of a sudden something inside of me said, no, this is not the way to be. This is just, there's something wrong with this. And, and and that's just me, but but I have to assume that other people are having that also, and and some people are just saying, "No, nah, I don't want any part of this," because there's so many who, who again do not believe. Mm. Or, it's or so can- hard to understand. It's so hard to fathom why some of the people we would least expect to receive truth will. And those that we think would easily receive it will not. And um, I think what you're saying too, Dan, is we all have this incredible story. And it's so important for us to um, share that when God gives us an opportunity. Because each one of us coming to him is an absolute miracle. And I think you're done living the false reality is really um when i had this friend that came over and she's people out there are nuts i i I don't understand why they're doing the things that they're doing and i just said because they're living a false reality and she just stopped and was like yes you know it's um this past summer, there was a a local town event up in Maine where I was where I'm living now, and I went to hand out literature. It was actually on Sabbath, and uh, I prayed, you know, that you know each piece would 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 reach the eyes and the heart of of whoever God, you know, ordained from the foundation of the world. And then when I handed them out, and I I just kind of I had my electric bike with me, and I had just had the books in the back and of the I had kind of some milk crates there to carry things and I would just stand there and kind of if someone walked by I just sort of put my hand out with a piece of literature not didn't even say anything necessarily and just if they wanted to take it they could take it and if they didn't they walked by and I marveled about who took it and who didn't take it when I would I would think to myself well this one definitely won't take it and they would be the one to take it <laughs> and the ones that we thought for sure would take it, they didn't, they weren't interested at all. You know, ones with, you know, tattoos from head to toe were the ones taking the literature. <laughs> and uh, you just, you don't know hearts. <laughs> there was, there was two, my wife and I, in the early days, uh, within gathering, I don't know if people are aware of in gathering, mm. um, for Audra and things like that. Um we would go to um, very rich areas of Andover, and the response was poor. It says, let's go to where we grew up. We went into the poorer sections of the projects, and it was always amazing how people would pour out their hearts and mm-hmm. give money um, in the poorer sections that didn't have anything. Yeah. You know, I was always amazed by that. Yeah. Did you ever hear of the uh, story? I mean, we can you can hear it on three at the end. It's a it's an older woman who um, they were talking about that these people really needed um, some funds, and they were you know, and uh, her and her sister are so excited. They go out and they gather all these funds. They made things. They sold it, and and so when it time came that it all the funds were given to them. They turned around and they gave it to their mother and they were kind of like shocked. They said, you know, until then we didn't realize we were poor. (laughs) It it just blew them away. And uh, they ended up taking the money anyways and giving it to the missionaries or something because, (laughs) but, but, you know, 
Amen. It, uh, it was a true story. Well, it's it's pretty well known in charitable circles that 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 poor people consistently give more than than rich people. Mm -hmm. Yes, you Thank know, there's, Donnie and I were talking about this the other day, where the Lord says the poor will always be with you. Why? Why? You have those that are poor in economic ways, right? But they're the ones that understand what it means to be poor. Then you have those that are poor in spirit. Right, poor in spirit, yeah. Right, but but both ways is 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 to grow us. And it's Character to development. Yes, yes. Actually, especially for the rich. <laughs> That's why the poor are there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reading in uh, Proverbs the other day, it says that <clears throat> let the poor man um, rejoice in exaltation and let the rich man in his humiliation. Praise mm. God. Well, the Amen. rich man has so much to lose, right? The, mm -hmm. the rich young ruler, try, you don't want to give up all of that that you've gotten. And, and that's why it's probably easy, easier for us that are, we'll say the word poor, uh, to come to him because, hey, uh, it, it's the, the dollar value. I don't know how else to put it, but it's just, you know, the rich just have this... Uh, it appears, but here we are judging people, and it's it's not right. I'll bet you there's some people with money who um, are part of the church family, and there's some that not. But but it's our preconceived notions how we look at others, and and all of a sudden we pigeonhole them that this person's got a lot of money, they're not going to pay any attention. Although Jesus himself pulled out the rich young ruler, right? For, yeah. for a reason, for a reason, you know, where, where your whatever is, so is your heart, or wherever your treasure is. Yeah, there is your heart, you know. Now, you want to be careful about this, because Mary and Jim have this thought process about that rich young ruler farther down the road, right, Jim? That's right. <laughs> there was still hope for him. Yes. Absolutely. That moment in time, he walked away, but... We don't know what happened a year later. That's right. That's like right. we know many of the Pharisees turned their heart to, to Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what Acts says. Many. We, we, you know, we, we always, well, I think it's important to always, you never approach anybody that they're going to, they, they, they're going to reject Christ. You always have the hope that they're going to accept them. Mm. How else do you approach them? Mm. Amen. Mm. Sister White also said that actually every new place that we go with the message of truth, that you were supposed to first witness to the wealthy people in that area. Uh -huh. She says that if you did that in faith, that God would reach some of them and then they would finance the work there and you wouldn't need to bring any money with you at all or any resources that he would use what was in that area. Amen. That, but we yeah. we think the the rich aren't interested, and we go first to the poor and try to get right. established there. But that's actually not what God said to do. <laughs> right. And but, I and I think I think too is that the mindset there is they're searching as well as anyone else. I mean, just tell. But I think for ev everyone on earth would love to hear for such a time as this is why. You are where you are, mm. whether it be rich, poor, whatever, for such a time as this, mm. that yeah. I wanted to use you for this. And I think that's tremendous, you know. And I I, I was uh, talking with Donnie. You know, my mom was a widow at 36 with seven kids. And uh, the oldest was 13. The youngest was going to be four, uh, four month, three months later. But I, one thing that I am so grateful for is we all learned to be content with what we had. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, yeah, that's one it's thing that I say. It's important to remember that um, the woman who gave two mites, mm -hmm. uh, that was six minutes 
worth of work for a day mm. was worth six minutes. Mm. And so, um, but she gave everything. And so <laughs> if we're rich, the, the message there is that we should give everything. Amen. Mm. Amen. And become poor. Amen. And inspiration has told us that that, that little gift of six minutes work has inspired untold millions <laughs> in, over the 2,000 years. Yeah. As a Amen. response to her faith. Amen. Yes. The two mites were worth six minutes of labor. Hmm. Mercy. And yet, and yet, she gave everything. Everything. That's right. It's profound. Yeah, very, very something yeah. to think about. Well, that's like with, with, with Jesus, you know, when he said, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. You know, people take that verse and say, well, see, Jesus said to pay taxes. But, you know, he didn't say not to. But really, Jesus didn't have anything that was Caesar's. <laughs> Everything that Jesus had was God's. And so he rendered it all to God. In fact, he, he literally didn't have a penny. That's why he said, show me a penny. <laughs> he couldn't reach in his pocket to pull out a penny to, to give the illustration. He literally was penniless and had to say, show me a penny. And he, he didn't have anything of Caesar's to render and, to Caesar. And it's, and it's so interesting that Jesus was such a good friend to Judas Iscariot. He, was, he loved Judas so much he gave him charge of the purse, knowing full well that he needed to overcome that. And Jesus was such a good friend to him and, 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 and uh, assigned him the role, um, um, or at least allowed him the role of overseeing the funds that they had, um, that he would manage it right. He wanted him to overcome, so he gave him that object lesson. Mm -hmm. And even in the end, he said, friend. Yeah. In the garden. Hmm. Friend. Yeah. I mean, he, he, was, he was ready to forgive him right then and there. Mm -hmm. Loving Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. I thank you so much for Jesus mm -hmm. and the sacrifice that he has made for us that we can come to you for a deeper understanding of who you are and for the changes that you can wrought in our hearts and our minds and our souls. And we are wretched, poor, and blind, dear Lord. We, we recognize our condition, but we are so thankful that you who began this work in us are faithful and you will complete it. Mm -hmm. And we doubt in ourselves, dear Lord. We doubt in ourselves so many times um, who you are and what's coming. And we're so human. We're so selfish and human. Forgive us of this, dear Lord. Open our hearts to fully know you, to understand you, and to walk with you as we should. I thank you for this study and I thank you again for your word. Pray that you keep all of us safe and continue to teach us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.